Again, it's 407-490-4019, this power and prayer. The word says with two or more gathered in his name, that he is in the midst of us. So he hears our prayers. We give him a, um, a thank you and give him a, a clap of praise for allowing baby Nora to go through that surgery well. She is doing great. And uh, we are so thankful and grateful for that, Jesus, that he heard our prayers, that he had angels surrounding her in that room, and that the doctors were led by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Hannah and Richard, if you're watching us, we miss you guys. And uh, we know we're going to see you soon. And uh, we pray blessings over baby Nora tonight. Um, I want to give you a quick update on the Walk for Life. We only have a little over a week left, guys. So... If you have not given, if you have not been able to sow anything, now is the time. Your blessing will be blessed. I promise you that, that this whole walk has been guided by the hand of God. We have seen so many, many miracles through this walk, so many people just giving out of nowhere. Like we, we were getting just donations left and right, and we're number one yesterday. Today we're number two but that's because of the grace of God. We have a small church here. This church has small members, but we have a big heart. And it's not over yet. We're going to continue raising funds because it takes a lot to do things in the kingdom. And we know that the executive director of that clinic has worked very hard to get, get us where we are today so that we can have that pregnancy clinic. At least we have already two, almost three, going to be constructed if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have those clinics. You know, the Bible says that somebody plants and somebody waters. She has planted. And we want to do everything we can to make sure that we, we are watering those seeds. Amen? Uh, please share. If you've already given, please share with social media. Share with your family, your friends, on texts, on emails. Just continue sharing. What we're doing is something great and mighty, and the Lord is very pleased with us. So we thank you so much. Uh, we're going to start with Psalm 91. If you can please go there so we can declare this uh, powerful scripture. And we'll declare that together. And let's begin. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste in noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will, I will deliver, deliver him and honor, honor him. With long life, life I, will I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. salvation. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Pastor Street, service that meat and potato. <laughs> Have a blessed Bible study. God is great. Amen. Are we good? All right. So um, before I start the service, I just want to remind everybody this uh, Friday is our Friday night of prayer. And I encourage everyone to come prepared. I hope uh, you guys are, uh, I know some of you are already participating in this time of fast. Friday is very crucial for us. Um, come with uh, preparation and uh, come to um, expose the word of the Lord. So we can come and uh, speak uh, life and prepare ourselves, uh, prepare ourselves to um, see what God has in store for us. I just want us to be prepared rightly so that, um, you know, life is full of transitions. I want you to remember that all the time. Life is full of transitions. And it's always um, an outcome 
can be this or that. But what we can do is mitigating it rightly so it will be this, which would be the Lord's plan. So God has given us the, the ability to participate in his will such that we can land. You know, if you leave uh, a ship when it is in turbulence or in, in it is in some kind of a storm, if you just uh, leave it alone, what happens is... Um, Oftentimes it becomes a shipwreck. Sometimes it lands on a safe land. Sometimes it's still wandering out there. But many times uh, the problem with that is we did not take hold of the direction. We did not try uh, to uh, take hold of the direction and see where it is going, where it needs to go. We need to be sending it where it belongs. That's what the Lord requires of us so right now um for this friday come prepared come with a word come uh with that excitement with the lord that we are taking um our ship in the course that he has ordained us amen i like for you to come prepared for that this time this is one other thing the lord said this time this with this transition with this change um he was telling me there is an answer in the body not with me. So I am waiting to see what the Lord has to speak. I'm waiting to see what the Lord has to work through. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward for what God is doing. It is a little out of my comfort zone because uh, <laughs> that is not how I, I oftentimes operate. But this is how God has said. I'm very excited to see what God has already planned and placed. I want you to all lift your hands up with me please just for a quick minute by an, this is an act of faith my hands are blessed I am anointed I release the glory of God these hands work the miracles of the Lord I am his miracle Jesus use me to fulfill your will in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory be to God in heaven. Hallelujah. Awesome. We are studying on the gifts of the Spirit. First Corinthians, this is one of the most important uh, 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 books to read, a letter to read in a way. Um, Paul has, you know, that's a very beautiful way he connects with people. He wrote letters. He, he, a lot of them, um, there is a lot of correction that is in there. This not admonish. Uh, he, he, it was, it was not just appreciation. He, he tries to give the correction. Um, he would balance them out. He would give them in such a way that people are uplifted, people are built, and people are connected in that word. Amen. So I'm uh, looking forward uh, uh, to, into this one, um, where we are actually coming to. The end of this, this is the 15th chapter, there is only one more chapter left. Um, um, the first Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 4, reads basically this. I thank my God uh, always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come short of no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, gifts and waiting has to go hand in hand. We always need to, um, the more we grow in the spirit, it also helps you how to wait upon the Lord. The more we are growing in the spirit is how we can learn how to wait on the Lord. Many times the problem with, uh, with us as Christians is we are not able to wait. Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord has so many different meanings, but I'm not going to go into all those things. I have covered some of them in the past, but I, I just want us to remember, waiting on the Lord is not just sitting there and not doing anything. That has a good word in the Bible. It's called laziness. Laziness and waiting is not the same. Uh, um, so instead of us trying to... Um, 
um, mix up things and while we are being lazy, we try to say, oh, I'm waiting on the Lord. Uh, no. We are, not being, we are not waiting on the Lord. Instead, we are being lazy. So we just need to differentiate ourselves. Are we waiting on the Lord or am I being lazy? So that's a question we have to ask. I probably would ask that question regularly. I just won't, don't, don't ask that question uh, uh, every now and then, but I ask that regularly. Am I being lazy or am I, be, am I waiting on the Lord? Because the Bible says, They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up with wings like eagles. I'd rather mount up than sit down. Amen? So, um, 1 Corinthians 15. Last week we studied a lot about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is very important. We have to have and be operating in them and exercising in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The best way for you to be able to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit is if you exercise in the gifts of your own born-again spirit. If your born-again spirit is not exercised, if it is not exercising, I'm telling you, your gifts are futile. Your gifts will sound like a, uh, uh, like a symbol, Bible says. Like clanging symbols. There is no, there is just sound. There is no real depth to it or there is no real real uh, 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 um, purpose to it. So you have to understand how important it is not about your gifts. Can somebody say that? It is not about my gift. You know, how much God the Holy, Holy Spirit is giving you the gift, that doesn't mean anything if you don't have the spiritual character. You have to have the spiritual character, not your spiritual gift. Before you can have the spiritual gift, let's work on the spiritual character. Even if it is a small gift that has been given to you, even if it is the least of the gifts that was given to you, if you have the spiritual character, that gift will excel beyond measure. If you really want to see the fruit of the Spirit working, uh, um, the gift of the Spirit uh, uh, bearing the fruit that it ought to bear. First Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Which also you received and in which you also stand. The problem with the gospel preaching these days is this, very simple. They haven't received what they are preaching. When you don't receive what God has given you, you are not equipped to preach. Amen? The first, prop, first thing is you will have to receive for you to be able to reproduce. You cannot reproduce something that you have not received. That's why what you see out there is a gospel that is so shallow because that person that is giving out is not something that person have received. They understand in their, in, their, in their understanding, in their mind, in their, in their intellect, they are understanding it. They have great connection to the scripture to scripture. But when you don't receive it, because this is something, a heart to heart reaction. The gospel is the heart of the Lord and now your heart is receiving it. Now you are creating the reaction and once it is coming out of you from that heart reaction, there is power. Otherwise, gospel becomes empty, empty words. Which is what is full of, uh, full, full of all around us. So we need to stop giving what we have not received. We have to receive first. When we don't receive it, don't give it to others. You know, have I received it? Am I living in it? If you yourself is doubting it, why would you give it to others? If you yourself is not able to live in it, why would you give it to others? You know, a lot of times I see these uh, uh, evangelists in the church. They like to go heal, uh, uh, lay hands on the sick and uh, 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 speak about the healing. But uh, they themselves struggle with the revelation of healing. I'm not talking about your healing. The revelation of the healing, you will have to have first 
received the revelation of the healing. Once you receive the revelation of the healing, you can translate that revelation to others. If we don't receive it, we don't have it. That's why most of the gospel is futile in your life because you have not received it. We are not seeing the full power of the gospel in our lives only because we have not received it. Amen? Uh, when you receive, in which you stand. Can somebody say stand? Gospel is for you to stand, not for you to sit, not for you to relax. Gospel has been given to us for us to stand. Now the gift is coming. This, is, this chapter deals with what we can call as the ultimate gift of gifts. The ultimate gift is where he is getting us into. By which you were, you are saved. If you hold fast um, that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. If we don't hold fast to the gospel that has come to us, if we don't hold fast to the word that has come to us, it is in vain. The gospel didn't work for me because you didn't hold fast. You, if you received it and held fast to it, the gospel will produce the results. Otherwise, gospel is just a story. Maybe some historic lesson. We are so stuck in this thing as Christians. We are so weak in our life as a Christian. Because we are not producing the results of the gospel. Because we first have not received the gospel. Nor are we steadfast or standing in the gospel. Look at this. It is not about standing for the gospel. It is about you standing in the gospel. When you stand in the gospel, standing for the gospel becomes automatic. It's a byproduct. Most of the times you are like, I'm standing for this, I'm standing for this. No, no, no. First stand in it. You want to stand for your family first, stand in the family first. Amen. I'm providing for the family. No, inside first. Then you can do the outside work. Unless you believed in vain. Your belief is going for vain. If you don't connect. Have that steadfast nature. Having that, that rooted. Or if you are not standing on the gospel. That is what your belief system. Every day my belief system has to be built on the gospel. Every action that I am conducting has to be in, in, in sync with the gospel. If that is not what I am doing, you are full of fear. This is why you see Christians that are full of fear because they should have been standing on the gospel. They should have been digging their feet into the gospel. Instead, they dig a whole lot into the world rather than in the world. Take a survey of yourself. How much of your thoughts that you wasted on your fears than in the word of God. Just take a survey for today. Most of your thought process is set on thinking and dwelling on the things that are of the world. That are driven by fear. That are producing fear. How much of us are putting our effort in thinking the word? Amen. When you can have the word work in you, when you are standing in it, it automatically out of the belly flows the issues of life. For I delivered you first of all, that which I also received. Glory be to God. Paul was not preaching something that he hadn't received. He's not a lecturer. Amen. Gospel is not to be lectured. Gospel is not to be lectured. I don't, you know, the lecturer doesn't have to go build the bridges. But if you are an engineer that is under that lecturer, you are required to build the bridges. He may not have any experience about the bridge, uh, bridge building, yet he will teach you about it. 
That's why it is lecture. If you go lecture to iron there, oh, uh, iron, you're supposed to work like this, will it work? You got to make sure you make it work. Amen? God called us to be the engineers of his word, not for us to be the lecturers of his word. Where we make things work, where we put things together, configure them so that you will see how it works in your life. How many of you believe God is an architecture? He's an architect, right? If he is an architect, you are his son, isn't it? Which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Where do you find the evidence all the time? According to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. Not according to your feelings. Not according to the reality that you are living in. According to the scriptures. And that he, ha he was seen by Kep uh, Kepa, then uh, uh, by the twelve. After, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by the apostles. Then last of all, who was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. You know, the true humility he is presenting, I have seen people... Take this statement, I am the least of all, and present to everybody, oh, I am, I am a dirty fellow, I am a least person, I am a weak person. When we do that, uh, uh, we think we are presenting humility, but I'm telling you something, you are presenting arrogance and pride. That is true arrogance, you are saying, God did not save you. Because the statement doesn't end there. It's a sentence. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a quote. You'll have to understand the, all, all, all the rest. He says, you know, I'm the least of all because I persecuted the church of God. I persecuted the church of God. The very thing that I am proclaiming now, one day I was killing them. That's why I feel I'm the least of them. I'm not worthy for it. But look at this, what he says. But, can somebody shout but? But that but, what, what it does, it annuls everything that was said up until then. He annulled everything and now he comes to the place by the grace of God. But by the grace of? But by the grace of God. That is the true gift. The ultimate gift. That God has given to mankind. Grace. Grace. Oftentimes grace is abused and misunderstood. But I'm, let us see what this talks about. But by the grace of God. That I am what I am. But by the grace of God. I am what I am. If God called you an apostle. Then you are an apostle. By what? By the grace. If God called you to be a mo woman, what are you? By the grace of God. If God called you to be a man, you are a man. By what? The grace of God. If God called you to be a father, you are a father. By the grace of God. If God called you to be a mother, you are a mother. By the grace of God. When you are saying that is not it, that means you don't know what grace is. Amen? The but, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. That's a very powerful statement to ponder on. Are you wasting the grace God has given to you? 
Are we wasting the grace that God has bestowed upon us? We have to think about that. Are we using the grace or are we abusing the grace? Or are we not even using the grace? That's a, but I labored more abundantly than they all. If you just stop there, Paul is a laborer. And he is presenting himself, I labored more than them all. If you just take that statement, you will think, oh my goodness, Paul was a hard worker. God is going to reward hard work. That is what we will look at. We have to outrun everybody. I got, we got to outwork everybody. No, that is not true. That is not true. He says that I, I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was within me. Glory be to God in heaven. The grace of God which was within me. Can somebody appropriate that statement? Grace of God which was within me. Grace of God is within you. That is what enables you to be that father. That is what enables you to be that pastor. That is what enables you to be that mother. That is what enables you to be that father, to be that provider. Even though you're working hard and you're trying to put things together, it is the grace of God that can convert that for you. Now, is that a false humility? That he is just saying like, okay, I labored it all. But you know what? No, no, no. It's just the grace of God. I've seen people do that too. I've seen people do that too. But here, is it false humility or true acknowledgement? We have to think for that. Think of that. That's why many times I make the statement, I am for sure I know. If I have been given the marriage I have been given now, by myself, I would have wrecked it in the first week itself. Without a shadow of doubt. But the grace of God. But the grace of God. I depended on the grace of God within me. And I continue to depend on that. I don't take anything for granted because grace is the one that has been given to me. If I don't depend on the grace, I am not going to be that good husband or good father or whatever it is. I can't be. Can somebody say it is grace? Come on, shout it out. It is grace. It is only grace that can give us that empowerment. Mind you, that is the biggest gift that God has given to us. That is the best gift God has given to mankind. His grace. Undeserved, unmerited favor. Let me tell you something. If you have this doubt, let me erase that doubt. You don't qualify for it. Only the blood of Jesus qualifies you for it. Grace of God which was with me, therefore, whether it was I or they... No, I, I got to go back. But by the grace that I am what I am, his grace toward... Uh, oh, where is this? Okay. I'm coming. I labored more abundantly than all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me, which, uh, uh, the grace of God which was with me, therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. You see the importance of preacher receiving what the preacher did not receive if he is preaching the believer will receive that that is why the church is full of fear the preacher only received fear so he preaches fear and hence anybody and everybody that believes that believes in that fear that is what we have as a church all around us that is what we are, we are known to be building all around us. We build our life around the false uh, facts of the devil. Yet we preach it as the gospel. 
Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? This is a very logical, spiritually logical conclusion Paul draws here. This is very important for you, even to counter your own doubts. Think about this. If you are a spiritual student, there are doubts that continue to run in you. And when those doubts are continuing in you, you will have to debate yourself with the spiritual logics. You will have to. And that is how you create a firm foundation for your faith. You will have to ask your questions, what about this then? When you learn to debate with yourself, it's easier for you to debate with anybody. You know, the only person that, the only, now I've seen, I, I've ran many projects, many projects, um, uh, uh, even in software world or whatever. Most of the times I fail in a project because of the questions I didn't ask. But I'm going to leave you with that, but I'm going on, moving on here. If, now, if Christ is preached that he had been raised from the dead... How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So he is doing a by implication. If that is not true, this is not true. If this is true, that has to be true too. It can't be one or the other. If Christ is resurrected, your resurrection is guaranteed. So this is where our faith has to come. If Christ is resurrected, I am resurrected too. So when we are coming to that, that position, what is happening is whatever is Christ, you are appropriating in your life so you may have the same miracle in your life. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Christian, can I give something here? Christian, if you don't believe, <laughs> not you Christian, <laughs> but a Christian in general, I'm saying, <laughs> a Christian, if you don't believe in resurrection, and if you don't believe you are going to be resurrected, your faith is empty. Your faith is useless. That's just true. Oh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Let me tell you something. Your faith will never work for you. If you can't believe in resurrection of the Christ, you can't believe anything. You just want to believe that Jesus walked on this earth? That's a miracle in itself. The Son of God, the one and only is walking on this earth. That's a miracle in itself. If you can believe that, you ought to believe that He is resurrected. If you can't believe he is resurrected, if you can't believe in that reaction of resurrection, you don't have faith. Can I help you with that? If you don't believe in resurrection, you don't have faith. Oh, you're being so harsh. No, I'm starting you with basics. That is the basic foundation of Christian faith. Believing in the resurrection. And also believing, if you believe in the resurrection of Christ, you are also bound and necessary to build in your believe in your resurrection as well. It might look harsh, but I'm building a mindset and a spiritual set in here, so you will understand how to roll over the mountains, how to roll them, how to turn them around. Because if the resurrection is true, your resurrection is also true. That means nothing can bind you down. Nothing can put you down. Nothing can hold you down. Again, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God. Not Christ, of God. 
because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. See the connection. If you don't believe in Christ's resurrection, you don't have a connection to the Father. This should allow you to understand all the religions around us who are trying to tell us, oh, it's all the same thing. All of us are going to the same thing. No, you're not. <coughs> you're never going there. Because we have testified God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact dead, uh, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Come on church, that looks depressing, but that is the most hopeful statement you will have to listen. If he is risen, I'm also risen. Come on church, if he is risen, I'm also risen. Come on. If he is risen, I'm also risen. Because if he is, and I'm, I am that. In through that we are empowering ourselves to the power of resurrection. Our faith has weight now. Our faith has substance now because we are believing in resurrection. If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Because there is no remission of sins without Christ, isn't it? Christ being resurrected. If Christ is not resurrected, where is your justification? Nowhere you can go finding justification. Isn't that Micah who writes saying, even if I offer my firstborn, where is it? You're still in your sins. That's the problem. We are still in our sins. We are sin bound because you haven't received Christ. It's not about that prayer or going to the church. Have we received the fullness of Christ? That is what eliminates the sin of our life. Otherwise you are sin bound. We can also look at the other way. If we are being sin bound and we are always sin found, then we have to understand we are not fully receiving Christ. If Christ can come out of the dead, can he not pull you out of the resurrection, out of your addictions? Come on church. Can he not get you out of your miry clay? It doesn't matter what it is. You are supposed to come out. You cannot, you know, when the Lord came out, when he, risen, he was risen, he, he also commanded a command over us, come up. So everybody that is dead, everybody that is gone down has to come along with him. <laughs> then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men the most pitiable. You are worth feeling sorry if there is no Christ. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become, look at this, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He was the first to come out of the dead. When he have come out, he have become the first fruits of everybody that have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. Why was Christ needed to be a man? For resurrection. For resurrection. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Glory be to God. My father gave me death. My eternal father gave me life. Glory. Which, one way, which way we go? Our family has given us death. Our nature, our physical self has given us death. Because sin have traveled. 
But whereas Christ have come into my life. And when he have come, he have given me life. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father. When, and when he puts an end to the rule, and all, uh, the rule, all rule, all authority, and all power. Look at this. Now, why is he has to, he, he, then he comes the end. He has to bring the end. What is that end? He delivers the kingdom of God, the Father. God the Father. He's trying to give us the Father's kingdom. That is the end. That is where it concludes. When it is concluded, what happens? When he puts an end, what is he going to do? To all rule, all authority, and all power. Don't you be scared of any power that is out there. Don't you be scared of any authority that is out there. Don't you be scared of any rule out there. Because we are turning air. Come on church. Come on I expected a better, better, better reaction than that. We are turning air. Shout amen to that. We are in the business of turning it. That is what Christ is all about. I'm going to end these jokers. So-called strong power, strong forces, everything will be ended. Because he is the only one legally won the right over this earth. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. If he can destroy death, how much is all these companies and all these governments and all these institutions? How big are they? Anything has to, is bound to die, isn't it? Anything and everything is bound to death. If he can annul death, think about anything else. Now I'm challenging every Christian, charge up your faith. Have the charge, have faith in God, knowing this is not our gloom days, but this, these are our best days, glorious days. Now we live in the glory of the Lord. These are our best days. For he has to put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put, um, all things uh, are, uh, 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 sorry, uh, he says all things are put under him. It is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the son himself will also subject to him who put all things under him. That God may be all in all. Uh, let me ask let me tell you this thing Jesus's need of the father is different from your need of the father are you with me here Jesus need doesn't need the father for him to exist but you do that is why Jesus has to come in that route to be the son behold this is my son whom I have begotten Amen. He chose to be the son even though he was an equal. Are you with me here? The God, the Jesus did not become the son because he needed a father. He is the creator. All things that have been created are created through him. Amen. If everything is created through him, why does he need a creator? He doesn't need a creator. Amen. Because he himself is the creator. Yet for your sake he changes everything. I will subject myself to the one. 
Because he is the only one he can trust. The father. The father comes into the picture where everything is put under the feet of Jesus. And Jesus comes and pledges allegiance to the father. Remember what Jesus says, me and my father are one. He puts all things under him that God may be all in all. So we have to always remember that Jesus doesn't need the father like the way we do. He made that a need for him for our sake. Amen. What a love, what a love, what a great love. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not raise at all? And when they are, uh, uh, why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do you, why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? If we don't believe in resurrection, why do I have to have the hate mail? Why do I have to have the risks? Let me be very honest. If, I want, if I'm not preaching to you the, the, the resurrection message, your hate is not worthy for me. Or your dislike, your disdain, whatever it may be. It is not worthy for me. I don't need to put up with you for any other reason but for the resurrection. Life is many times put at risk, particularly I can tell for myself. Life is put at very big risks in my life. Why do I do that? Why am I willing to do that? Is because of the belief that I have in the resurrection. Amen. The apostles considered their life as worthless for the gospel's sake. That's why they are saying, why would I jeopardize my life? If the gospel is not true. He says every hour, not every, every other day or every other year, he gets threat. He was talking about life threats. He got them every day. I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts, at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's why I can't have faith in evolution. There is no purpose in it. You eat, you die, you're done. What's the big deal? Oh, we got to build this, we got to do this, we got to, you know, all these so-called uh, atheists or people that believe in evolution, they're so fighting so hard to stop this earth. If they truly believe in what they preach, why do they stop? It is bound to be that, isn't it? That's why evolution is garbage. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits what is an evil company what are the good habits good habits is simple they hear your good habit is to believe in resurrection that's a good habit it has to become a habitual thing i believe in resurrection no matter what happens that should become a habit for us amen the, that Evil company. What is an evil company? Any, anything evil is very simple, right? Anything that opposes God. The thought, the idea, the word, it doesn't matter what it is. Any form it can come. Evil doesn't have to be something that comes and stands in you, try to stab you. If it is nudging you out of your faith in, belief, in, in, in resurrection, that's evil. Amen? So the evil company corrupts good habit. The evil company can come through people. Evil company can come through TVs. Evil company can th come through anything that you hear, anything that you see, even from your whatever you are exposing yourself to. That is a company. You are in the company. Amen? Awake to righteousness and do not sin. 
when you are awake to the righteousness that your corresponding action is simple you don't sin because righteousness becomes more valuable than your sin because i i strive to live right with god rather than me wanting to live in my sin and especially when you know the righteousness is the gift you admire it you live in it you want to enjoy it when the more you are enjoying it you will realize how much you are not worthy of it yet you are grateful that you have the gift of righteousness awake to the righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of god i speak this to your shame now let me ask us a question is he shaming us we got to have an answer if paul was to come and take a record of us how much are we pursuing to walk in the gift of righteousness to walk in the gift of grace rather than working for your own self but someone will say how are the dead raised up and what, what with what body um, do they come foolish one what do you what you sow is not what is what what you sow is not made alive unless it dies and what you sow you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grey perhaps wheat or some other grain but god gives it a body as he pleases are you with me here do you know god is the lord of harvest that means he can define how it's going to come out the only resurrected body that we have seen is that that of jesus christ how it operated how it walked through the walls and how it went in any any place it just traveled through right but here god is giving us an encouraging word here says you know what you don't worry about it i got a good plan for you maybe you got all the calories you have on this earth but i got a good plan for you maybe you know that's why we have to pursue more on having the glory of the lord filled our body rather than our own fat and and cholesterol and all those kinds of things have more of the glory of god the more we have the glory of god the more we are going to reproduce a glorious body amen <laughs> and to each seed its own body what a glorious thing i'm excited all flesh is not the same flesh look at this all flesh is not the same flesh but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of animals another of fish another of bird, bir birds look at this not everything is worthy of harvest amen not everything you know don't try to exalt things that are not worthy of it you know you can talk about oh somebody sits on something and you think oh this is antique this is worth something this is so old this is so valuable you can sit on it all you want if it if it doesn't cut it it's no value you know i like to see those shows sometimes the antique road shows all these people bring their things that have been given to them from generations some of them they get appraised so you uh, huge value they all get excited and some i want to see they have been keeping it for generations and generations and generations and they come to find out it's worth garbage are you collecting garbage or are you collecting antiques hey man just because something is old doesn't mean that has value are you with me so that's the same way not every flesh has the same value of reproduction that god is giving because jesus christ didn't die for dogs all these stupids that try to tell oh the dog dead it's going to go to hell heaven show me in the bible show me in the bible 
quit lying to yourself about all these falsehoods. There is no such thing in the Bible. There may be dogs in the heaven. There are heavenly beings. But not this dog resurrected and going to heaven. No, it's not. Just because you love your dog doesn't mean I can come and guarantee you that it's going to come to with you to, to heaven. I'd be lying. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Don't try to combine them. There is one glory for the sun, another glory for the moon. Another glory of the stars, another star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the body, resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Do you know what incorruption is? So quit defining it. All you know is corruption, how can you define incorruption? Maybe you can take it and say the opposite of this. Maybe. Maybe it's a whole different league. So try not to define it, but get excited about it. There's going to be something that is incorruptible. This is not going to fall apart. This is not going to fail apart. Look at this. It is sown in dishonor and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So it is written the first man Adam became a living being. If you just want to conduct yourself as a natural man, you are under the order of Adam. Are you all with me here? Now if you want to conduct yourself in the order of the spiritual body, then you are under the Adam that is the last Adam. Because the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Glory be to God in heaven. If you are connecting to him, that is the DNA you are connecting to. That is what you have been grafted to. If we are connecting to the DNA every single day of your life, you are life giving. You are never going to be life taking. Amen. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. After and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was, uh, was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also those who are... Come on, church. Are we heavenly or are we earthly? That is what we've been talking a whole lot. Why do you need to exercise your spirit? So you may have your heavenly abode. You may have to, you, you may have the living of a heavenly person, a spiritual body rather than just living a physical body. Oh, after all, I am a man. Yes, you are a man. But there is a new man in my life. His name is Jesus Christ. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit the incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on in corruptible your body suit is not allowed your humanness is not allowed so how are you going to take your human rights to heaven <laughs> that's just a joke <laughs> we fight for those human rights so much that we forget to fight for our spiritual rights 
You know, the, our constitution, one of the good things about our constitution, they don't say the government is giving those rights. They say that those are the rights that were given to every one of us by their creator. That's a powerful acknowledgement. No government that takes that God out of the picture, every government wants to control you. The rights for you, whether you call it the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Third Amendment, whatever that is, the right that we talk about, that has not been given to us by the U.S. government. Those rights have been given to us by, the, by God Almighty itself. They are only appropriating those rights. I'm not going to teach you civics, but let's move on. When this corruptible has put on the incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is in sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my bro beloved brethren, be steadfast. Look at this. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I labor in the Lord. When people say I'm laboring for the Lord, they are lying. When you don't know how to labor in the Lord, you can never learn how to labor for the Lord. The power of the gospel, I'm ending my message. The power of the gospel in your life is determined by how steadfastly you are holding on to it. If you are not going to hold on to the gospel. The power of the gospel is not working in you. We need to stop giving what we have not received. Quit giving what you have not received. Is the grace of God in your life being useful or vain? That's a question you will have to ask. Has it produced the results? The grace of God has been given to you for your sins to be forgiven. For you to get better. For you to be healed. For you to be delivered. For you to be well in your life. That is why the grace of God has been given. Are you using it? Remember Paul goes to the Lord and says, God, there is a thorn in my flesh. Take this away. He asked for that three times and the Lord says, my grace is sufficient. Use my grace and get rid of it. Use my grace and get rid of those thorns. Oh, I am like this. My attitude is like this. I am born like this. That's a lie. Oh, I'm born, I'm born liking women. I'm born liking this. No. Uh -uh. You have not used grace. You have not used grace. If you had used grace, you would become what God has created you in Christ. Amen. Is it you or is it his grace laboring in you? If you think you are working hard, then you are not using grace. If you can identify the grace of the Lord working through you. The more you acknowledge it, the more you identify it, the more you fall on it. I need your grace, God. That's why anytime you're making a commitment, if you want to fast, if you want to lose weight, if you want to do anything, first receive grace. First and foremost, receive grace for that. Not your effort, not your plan, not your labor. Labor in the grace. Evil company corrupts good habits. You will have to find, identify evil. 
Is it edifying your spirit? Or, or, or is it, is it uh, destroying your spirit? Is it weakening your spirit? Even if it is weakening your spirit, that's evil. Are you laboring for you or are you laboring in the Lord? I'm going to tell you something. 80-90% of the preachers that are preaching around the world, they think they are laboring. Yet when God calls, they are asking, God is asking them to come labor in Him. Amen? I pray that God will revolutionize our thinking and get us more acclimated with this gift, the gift of grace. So we may fully get nourished in that grace and grow in the grace and utilize the grace to the full till it overflows. Amen? You got something out of this today? Give God a hand clap of praise and we will end our service with our confession. Three, two, one. We are Covenant Fusion Church. We are a body of believers. We are blessed to be a blessing and we are filled for His glory. Amen. Don't forget again, Friday night is our night of prayer. Come prepared. It is time for us to see what God wants, wants to do through us. Amen. God bless you.